The parents of so-called no-fly list kids are back in Ottawa today to follow up on their meeting with the Prime Minister in September. What is the no-fly list? It was created in 2007 with an aim to flag travellers who are a potential threat. The problem is the system has seen other Canadians, including children, mistakenly flagged as high risk simply because their name is the same as someone else who is justifiably on the list. The federal government has promised a redress system. That legislation has passed the House of Commons and first reading in the Senate. So when can the kids and their families expect the issue to finally be resolved? Khadija Kaji and Amber Cambish are two parents whose kids have names on the no-fly list. Hi there to both of you. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming in. Uh, Khadija, we've spoken a lot over the years. It's nice to see you here in studio. I'll start off with you. Can you tell me a bit about how the no-fly list has affected your family? Uh, my son is nine now, and he's been flagged on this list since he was born, essentially. So ba basically his whole life. Um, and we've had trouble flying with him ever since he was six weeks old. Um, you know, just endless trouble, extended uh, waits at the airport, uh, extra security screenings for him, uh, and it's still ongoing. And Amber, it's your daughter, right? It is my daughter, yes. She is five years old. We've um, been experiencing it since she was three. Um, it always seems to happen when we are going home for Christmas to see grandparents, um, added stress of delays, extra delays um, over the holidays. And we've recently had an experience trying to board a cruise ship in Vancouver to go to Alaska. So. And what does that mean? Like when you say you have experiences, so so our viewers understand, what, what sorts of delays do you experience uh, when, when your daughter's name is flagged? Um, when you go to check in, either an airline or in this case even a cruise terminal, um, they will ask you to go into secondary security. So um, regardless of if you need documentation, um, such as a child, to go on a domestic flight, they will ask for birth certificates, passports, anything that will um, allow them to identify your child further before you can go through and get a boarding pass. This can take uh, 10 minutes, it could take uh, half an hour. And that's what advocates for a redress system have been pointing to, right? The idea that it's so difficult to, to there's no easy way of checking off and saying, oh, this, this isn't who we meant to have on the list, go ahead. And so when the government did finally uh, approve a redress system, it was built into B Bill C-59, their larger national security uh, piece of legislation. And I know you're here today talking to senators, talking to a number of politicians. What's your message to them, Khadija? So we uh, essentially our message is that this is a problem that has been impacting our children for many, many years, over a decade now. Uh, and we really need them to be champions of this uh, part six of C-59 uh, and uh, do whatever they can to push it through uh, and to ensure that our children don't have to face this for the rest of their lives. Uh, we're not legislative experts. We're not experts on C-59. We're just parents of these kids who are impacted on this list, and that's our interest in this. And what was their message back to you, Amber? Did you get any kind of assurances, for example, that they were as concerned about the timeline? Uh, absolutely. We are putting forward questions on timeline. We've been getting some responses, um, ideally uh, before the next election is called, hopefully before the summer. They are looking to try and have these things passed for us. We know that public safety is already working on the, um, the application, the new computer system that they need for it. So there are multiple timelines that are going on and they are looking to be um, heading forward. It is, Khadija, part of a really big national security bill, as I yeah. said. Are you worried at all that uh, the size of that bill and the, the heavy implications of it will hold back that part of it, which is specifically concerned with this issue, and that's the redress system? That is a concern of ours. Uh, we have posed that question to an, uh, a number of the members that we've met today, on uh, both sides uh, of the House and the Senate, um, and or all sides, I should say, not both, all sides. Uh, and um, they... We've been given some assurances that this shouldn't, we shouldn't be anxious about this piece of it. They are all confident that this will pass before um, the House rises at the end of uh, the year, so in June. And it has to, by the way, because there's an election after Right, that. So exactly. It's a big deal if it doesn't. Absolutely. So this, I mean, we've posed all of these questions to them. Um, they have told us that we have nothing to worry about, so I hope that they're right. Uh, and we're trusting them to do the right thing. Has there ever been any discussion, Amber, about parsing out the par portion of the bill that applies to your family and so many others instead of lodging it in with this, with this other really big piece of legislation? 
Um, we are not legislative experts. We don't really know or have, has, uh, those have sorts of things. Of but I did meet with Matthew Dubé, and we know that he has actually written a letter to the Senate that to suggest that that may be a way forward if Bill C-59 is going to take some extra time in, in, in the, the, the readings. What kind of timeline are you looking at right now for a redress system? I mean, when all is said and done, yeah. if, if this does pass, let's say, best case scenario by uh, the end of this sitting in, in June, what is the best case scenario, uh, again, for, for a redress system actually being up and running? Really, the best case scenario, and our, our anticipation is that uh, once the regulations are put into place upon the passing of the bill, uh, another 12 months from then, minimum. So I don't see anything uh, being done or being implemented at least until at least uh, the summer of 2020. Uh, but we'll see. Remains to be seen. And it, it, what are the stakes, Amber? Uh, if 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 that isn't you know if if 2020 is the earliest, what are the stakes if this bill doesn't get passed? If that redress system doesn't get uh, doesn't get put into place? Then unfortunately, everything that we have been doing for years um, is going to have to start over again. Uh, we will have to start this process of families that are coming to Ottawa. I've traveled from Vancouver twice now to do this. We start this process again. And that's something we don't want to have to look forward to. Um, it's not something we want to participate in further. We would like this to get done as soon as possible. And rem remind us and our viewers a little bit about what the effort has been like behind the scenes here, because it's, it's, it's kind of like nothing I've ever seen before. I've been covering it for a number of years. Yeah. And you have, I mean, parents from all across the country, people who have become attached to the cause from all across the country. And you have truly, truly lobbied members of government from every political stripe. Yeah, and I think a lot of people don't realize that we're not a registered organization, we're not a funded organization, we're literally just a group of parents and supporters who have come together to advocate on a cause that is meaningful to us. I mean, we all have skin in the game. Uh, you know, we've had experts like legislative experts, lawyers, and all sorts of like civil liberties organizations and stuff have also supported us uh, because this cause is meaningful to them for other reasons. Uh, but for us, I mean, it's our children. Uh, and, you know, like I just wanted to add to something Amber was saying, I don't want it to get to the point where our children are old enough now to have to advocate uh, for this themselves. You know, we would be hopeful that this would be resolved uh, before they're too much older. We already have some boys who have become adults since then, so... And, uh, and that's a big concern, right? Yeah. The idea of, of what happens once their parents are not traveling with them. Can you speak to that, Amber? Oh, absolutely. Um, with, with, with me, Alia is only five years old, so she'll be traveling with me for, for <laughs> a few, many more years. Um, Isa Ahmed, who is with us today, is 16 years old. Um, that He's already seen both of his brothers um, you know, hit adulthood and have to worry about these sorts of things on his own. He is here right now because he knows that's what's going to happen to him next. And all of us with the younger children are concerned that if this doesn't happen, that our children are going to be put in the same situation. Mm -hmm. And you said you had talked to some people who had kids who throughout this process yeah. have even become adults, right? Oh yeah, we know a few parents, a few uh, parents who have children who have since become adults. I mean, including Isa's brothers, He's two of Isa's brothers. Um, I mean, in Isa's family, the three boys actually are all impacted on this and two have since become adults. And we know several more who uh, are actually afraid of traveling because of some of the experiences that they've had uh, domestically and internationally. Um, so um, a couple of them I know for sure haven't traveled and they refuse to travel until this is resolved. Well, thanks for coming in and sharing your perspective, and uh, good luck with the fight, I guess. Thanks, <laughs> we'll see. Ashi. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Khadija. You. Thanks, Amber.